Hi everyone and welcome to Psychology with Miss Ralph. I'm going to start every session with a motivational quote just to cheer everyone up in these times of hardship. So today is the secret of getting ahead is getting started. There we go, so let's get started. So uh, there are some discussion questions on your PowerPoint and I'd like you to pause the video in a second and have a think about what you would answer, how would you answer all of these questions? Make sure you give yourself enough time to go through all of them. Press the pause button. Okay, let's go through the answers. So for bronze, what is imprinting? You should have said that it's an innate readiness to develop a strong bond with the mother, which takes place during a specific time in development. And we know that that is for um, children up to five years. How is this different from sexual imprinting? Well, it's the idea, sexual imprinting is the idea that it can affect who you choose to be with um, when you're an adult. So you tend to mate with the same kind of object that you imprinted on. So if you imprinted on another human, you're more likely to mate with another human. Um, and then finally for the bronze questions, describe the procedure and results of Lorenz study and Harlow study. I've just done it in brief here, but Lorenz studied goslings um, and they made sure that he hatched to they made sure that when they hatched they saw Lorenzo's face first and they found that they attached to Lorenz if he was the first person that they saw. Um, for Harlow he studied monkeys who were given a wire and a cloth mother and found that they spent around 17 hours on the cloth mother and they were the ones that they went to for comfort. Remember there are loads of variations of Harlow's study so just stick to the main ones. For the silver questions, um, what implications do animal studies have for human attachment? Well, Lorenz found that humans have a critical period just like animals, and therefore if they don't develop an attachment during this time to a primary caregiver, then they're more likely to suffer emotionally and intellectually and cognitively as well, actually. Um, so obviously it's important for them to develop um, and attach to a caregiver for everything to work well as an adult. Uh, Harlow found that comfort was more important in developing attachment than food and therefore it's important that the caregiver is responsive to their needs um, in order to make sure that children um, attach properly and are like do well in later life um, and this led on to social workers having a better understanding of the risks of like child neglect. Um, explain why Harlow's experiment has been criticised for ethics. Well, because the monkeys were distressed and this leads to lifelong like issues for the monkeys. They weren't able to socialise, they were very aggressive towards other monkeys and that was obviously a problem. And when they had went on to have children for themselves, they didn't know how to bring up the child um, and so they were often, the children were often neglected. Um, remember as an exam tip that you should be referring to ethical issues but you shouldn't be referring to the specific BPS ethical guidelines because they're only for animals and not for, uh, sorry they're only for humans and not for animals. For the gold question, uh, how do the conclusions of the animal studies link to the other parts of the attachment topic? Well we know that the critical period of animals is shown to be an important in attachment which is similar to children. Um, and explaining a strength and a weakness. Obviously, there are loads of these, but I've put for Lorenz a strength is that you can repeat, be, is being repeated with other animals such as um, ducks, um, and they've found similar results. Whereas a weakness is that it's not generalizable to humans because human attachment is much more complex. Like we have much more complex emotions, and therefore that changes how we interact with other humans. For Harlow, a strength is that his research has had a massive impact on psychologists' understanding of mother-infant attachments. And as we've said previously, like this has gone on to affect how we treat children and, and how we raise children. But a weakness of that is that the monkeys themselves were put under such severe stress, which obviously breaks the uh, animal ethical guidelines. And therefore, maybe the study shouldn't have gone ahead thinking about maybe a cost-benefit analysis. So... Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, attachment in terms of the learning theories. So we've already studied the learning theories um, when we looked at approaches, so I want you to go back to what you know about that. So pause the video and just have a, a think about what is the image showing. Use the three pictures and the word to replace the pictures in the image so that it talks about attachment instead. So how can we apply what's in those pictures at the top with Pavlov's dogs to attachment. Um, how is this suggesting why an attachment is formed between an infant and a mother? And then as a challenge, why do you think this is 
this idea is part of something called the learning theory. Off you go, pause the video. So for the bronze, um, you need to know that we learn to associate the bell with the food. Um, for the silver task, you need to know that the mother is going to be represented as the neutral stimulus. The bottle is represented as the unconditioned stimulus. So the bottle, like the food that's being given. So that could also be um, in, a, in other ways like breastfeeding. Um, and the pleasure is associated is the unconditioned response. Um, for the gold, how is, this, how is this suggesting why an attachment is formed between an infant and a mother? It says that we learn to associate the mother with being fed. So every time we're being fed by the mother, we remember now to associate the mother with pleasure as well. And for the challenge, um, why do we think this idea is part of something called the learning theory? It says that we learn to understand attachment. All right. So... You need to know for the oh sorry for question for what do you think the key terms underneath the image mean? We are talking about pleasure, so we need to associate the baby with the baby is the pleasure image, the bottle of food is the unconditioned stimulus, and the response is pleasure. So today, as I said, we're going to be talking about the explanations of attachment, and in this explanation of attachment, there is the learning theory of attachment. Um, just be aware that, that this isn't the only learning theory. Uh, sorry, this isn't the only theory of attachment that we're going to learn about. We're also going to talk about Bowlby's monotropic theory of attachment as well as some others. So today you need to be able to describe how babies become attached to their caregivers, um, apply the learning theory to explain why attachments do and do not occur, and be able to evaluate the learning theory of attachment. Remember, all of these are just as important as each other. So our bronze is our AO1, our silver is our AO2, and our gold is our AO2. And we need to make sure that we can do each of these um, equally well. So the learning theory of attachment, thinking back to what we already know. So it's obviously a set of ideas that were from the behaviorist approach and they be believe that we were born blank slates. Um, so we don't have any like prior knowledge. We just learn everything that we do and how we behave is all because of what we experience. So it's very much taking a nurture approach. Um, they also argue that all behaviour is learned through classical and operant conditioning. So we associate conditioning with learning, so a learned response. And then in terms of attachment, this is called cupboard love sometimes. So you might see it referred to in your textbook as a cupboard love, uh, cupboard love approach because it suggests children learn to love whoever feeds them. So you might see that um, phrase being used. So um, we already know some classical conditioning key terms, and so we've just gone over some of these. What I'd like you to do is have a go at matching the key terms to the definitions. So can you just pause the video and have a go? OK, so let's check our answers. So hopefully you should have got that classical conditioning goes of learning by association, that stimulus is anything internal or external that brings about a response. A response is any reaction in the presence of the stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that produces a reflex. Unconditioned response is an innate reflex. Neutral stimulus is a stimulus which does not naturally produce a response. Um, a conditioned stimulus is the new stimulus which produces the learnt response and a conditioned response is a learned response. Just make sure your answers are correct. OK, so we need to know the pro process of classical conditioning. So the first thing is, is that innately food brings babies pleasure because of survival. And therefore, the mother and the baby don't like the mother doesn't cause a response from the baby in this way. But when the mother provides the food for the baby, the baby feels pleasure. And after a while, the mother is associated with feelings of pleasure. So no matter whether the food is present or not, by the end, the child will feel pleasure when the mother is around. And so the learning theory suggests that at first, classical conditioning is a key part of an attachment. 
Um, and it's worth noting that we're going to talk about classical and operant conditioning, but in a way that they work together, whereas usually we see them as separate theories. So use the key terms and classical conditioning process to demonstrate attachment. So have a think about how you can write that in a way that makes sense to you. And then I'd like you to complete the fill in the gaps in your booklet for me about the classical conditioning process. And then if you've got a chance, have a think about how could classical conditioning explain someone ending up having a phobia of snakes after being bitten. This is a challenge task because we haven't done the psychopathology um, unit but if you um, we're going to go on and learn about this later so it's a really good idea to have a think about it now so pause the video have a go and then i'll come back to you with the answers okay let's go over the answers from your book then so the learning theory of attachment suggests that infants learn to form an attachment with their mother one way the attachment develops is through classical conditioning. According to this theory, the process begins with an innate stimulus response. In the case of attachment, the innate or unconditioned stimulus is food, which produces an innate or unconditioned response of pleasure. The mother or caregiver starts as a neutral stimulus and produces a neutral response. At first, the infant simply feels pleasure and comforted by the food. However, each time they are fed, the mother or caregiver is there too. And therefore, they become associated with the pleasure of being fed. Consequently, the mother becomes a learned or conditioned stimulus, and this produces the learned or conditioned response of pleasure. And this feeling of pleasure, pleasure sorry, is stimulated even without the food. This means that the infant feels happier when the mother is near, and this is the beginning of attachment. So hopefully that's what you've got. Remember that you can replay the video in case I went too fast. <laughs> okay, so make sure that somewhere in your notes that you've got a... Um, it might help to have like a diagram of this, even though you've got it written down, um, but make sure that you're clear on this process because this is important for uh, any essay question or exam question that you get. OK, we're going to watch hopefully a quick video um, and then I want you to think about how this might be showing learning theory. OK, so 
hopefully um, you should have seen the video and I want you to have a pause and think about what is Sheldon doing and why. Um, there is an error, can you spot it? Um, why two of the pictures, uh, you, sorry, using two of the pictures, why do babies cry? And using all of the pictures, why do you think the mum feeds the baby? Challenge, how, do you, how are the motivations of the mother and the baby different in this situation? So pause the video for a second and then have a think. Okay, so for the bronze task, you should have said that um, he's rewarding her with chocolate when she does what she wants. Um, and then for the silver, you, using two of the pictures, why do babies cry? You should have said babies cry in order to get fed. And then using all of the pictures, why do you think the mum feeds the baby? And this is because the baby cries um, and you feed the baby to stop the crying and then the baby is happy again. So we're using negative reinforcement here. We're removing the baby's um, anxiety and up, like feelings of being upset by giving the baby what it wants. And because the mother um, doesn't want the baby to cry, she is also being negatively reinforced to repeat this behaviour of feeding the baby when they cry. So how are the motivations of the mother and the baby different? It's because um, one is showing positive reinforcement and one is showing negative reinforcement. So um, you should have um, an idea of operant conditioning positive and negative, but let's just go over it. So operant conditioning is about learning through consequence, and those can be positive or negative consequences. Um, and positive reinforcement is when we repeat a behaviour because we're likely to get a reward, like being given chocolate every time, or we've talked about before, like giving stamps every time you do the correct behaviour, um, like handing in a good piece of work or answering a question really well. Um, and negative reinforcement is when you increase the likelihood of behaviour because you want to remove or escape from the unpleasant consequence. So, for example, doing your homework correctly because you and on, handing it in on time because you don't want to get um, an after school detention or an ESD. So um, when the baby performs an action, which is in this case crying, the baby receives the reward of food. So the baby feels happy because every time it cries, it knows it's going to get food. And this reinforces the baby's actions so that they are more likely to repeat the behaviour again. This is positive reinforcement and it explains how attachment is maintained. So originally when we were talking about classical conditioning, we we're talking about how the behaviour is formed and this is now saying that once it is formed, in order for it to be maintained, this needs to happen. At the same time as this is happening, the baby is crying and the mum feeds and cuddles the baby and this makes the mum feel happy because the baby isn't crying anymore and therefore the reward is reinforcing the action. So the mum is also being conditioned here, not just the baby. And this is negative reinforcement because we're removing the crying from the mum. So the mum isn't hearing the crying anymore. And so as we know, mums find it very stressful when their babies cry and it releases a, an innate response. If any of you have watched the Babies documentary on Netflix, it does talk about this as well, which is quite an interesting um, thing about measuring children's brain act, uh, parents' brain activity when the child cries. So how does this lead to attachment? So based on everything we've learned so far, why do you think the infant becomes attached to the mother? Pause the video and have a think. So the babies form an attachment and this is because the babies associate the mother with providing them with everything that they need and therefore, including food, and therefore they become attached to the mother. And this is linked to the idea of drive reduction, which argues that when we feel discomfort, we want to, or we have a drive to reduce this. So you're thirsty and you need water, so you have a like need to seek out water, and therefore you drink the water and you feel better. 
Um, I'm just going to stop there and in your booklet you'll see a section where you need to match up the key terms. So the key terms are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement and drive reduction. Could you just spend two minutes, um, pause the video and have a go on matching those up for me please. So hopefully you've matched those up and you should have the following. Positive reinforcement is associated with an increased likelihood of the behaviour being repeated because it involves a reward. And then it gives you an example specifically related to um, attachment. And it might just be worth highlighting some of that. So um, crying leads to response from the caregiver. Um, and then the, this prov as long as the caregiver provides the correct response, the reward reinforces the action so the infant repeats it again. Um, then you should have negative reinforcement going with the increased likelihood of behaviour being repeated because it involves the removal or escape of the reward. And again, you might want to highlight um, the caregiver is escaping from the unpleasant cries. And then finally, you should have drive reduction, which is the which argues that when we feel discomfort, this creates a drive to reduce this discomfort. Um, and you might want to add in there your example, which is um, on the PowerPoint right now, about the need for food or water, for example. You could also do an attachment one, so talk about like the need for milk as an example. In the paragraph above where it talks about operant conditioning and the paragraph starts operant conditioning involves learning to repeat behaviours or not depending on its consequences, you might just want to highlight the word consequences as that's a key term and it can often be forgotten in the exam technique because it doesn't sound like a key term. So consequences is a really important word to use when we're talking about operant conditioning so maybe just highlight it um, as a reminder. OK, we'll move on. So you've got primary and secondary reinforcers. This isn't something that we've discussed before in approaches. So um, just make sure you're familiar and comfortable with these key terms um, when we go through. So when an infant is fed, the driver of hunger is reduced, which produces a feeling of pleasure as they are comforted again. And this is rewarded and therefore feeding is an example of positive reinforcement. The food is a primary reinforcer because it directly supplies a reward. So anything that directly links to a reward, e.g. you give a really good answer, that gives you a stamp, that thing, so the really good answer, is the primary reinforcer. Anything, the mother or the caregiver who supplied the food is associated with that, so they're a secondary reinforcer. So as an example, I, Miss Ralph, would be a secondary reinforcer because you associate me with giving you a stamp for your good answer. So now you've associated me with um, your like positive attitude towards psychology because you get given stamps. <laughs> so make sure you're familiar with those key terms. Um, and you need to be familiar with using them in terms of relating to attachment. So uh, when you're done, uh, pause the video and have a go at answering the questions, um, sorry, filling in the gaps about operant conditioning underneath the boxes you just filled out. OK, so you should have the following. According to operant conditioning, the food satisfies the infant's hunger and makes it feel comfortable again, which is drive reduction. This is rewarding and therefore feeding behaviour is an example of positive reinforcement. The food is a primary reinforcer because it directly supplies a reward and the mother or caregiver who supplied the food is associated with the food and so becomes a secondary reinforcer. The infant is attached to the mother because she is a source of reward. Hopefully you've got that. If not, rewind the video and just make sure you've got it in your notes. So what I'd like you to do now is um, have a go at completing questions 16 and 17 in your booklet. Question 16 is outline how learning methods have been used to explain attachment in infants and it's worth six marks. And question 17 is learning theory provides one explanation of attachment. It suggests that attachment will be between an infant and the person who feeds it. However, the findings of some research studies do not support this explanation. Outline research findings that challenge the learning theory of attachment. So um, 
what I'd like you to do is make sure you have a go at answering those questions. Remember to highlight or underline or annotate the questions before you complete them. And then on the next slide, you'll find the answers to um, the mark scheme. So have a go, pause the video and then come back to it afterwards and we'll discuss what the answers are to the exam questions. Good luck. Okay, so um, for question 16, although it says mark scheme question 2 on there, so ignore that. For question 16, you should make sure that you've really clearly described how classical conditioning relates to attachment. So make sure that your example is clearly linked to attachment, but as it says in the first bit, um, the question states learning theory suggests attachment develops through classical and operant conditioning. So don't refer to that in your answer. Don't waste your time with it. Just go straight in with like how classical conditioning forms it and then how operant conditioning um, maintains it. And I think it's really important to use those words in your answer and make it really clear that um, classical conditioning and operant conditioning work together. So classical conditioning is forming it and then um, operant conditioning maintains the attachment and try and use the word attachment throughout your answer so make sure your answers are really clear I would avoid using like uh, UCS UCR without writing it out first remember that um, the examiners always encourage you to write unconditioned stimulus and then in brackets write UCS the likelihood is that you're not going to repeat it more than once so maybe just stick to writing it out in full um, so looking at the bands at the bottom, make sure that your answer is accurate and reasonably detailed. So remember, it's only worth what well, is only worth six marks. So you might just want to go into it. In more, I've made it up to six marks, but like you want to go into it in more detail. So just make sure you're comfortable with doing that. So for the second one, you've got to find research that challenges it. So we know that Schaefer and Emerson found that actually children attach to people who are more sensitive to their needs rather than due to who's being fed. So you could have used them. You could have also used Harlow and said that actually it's the one who gave them more comfort or Lorenz, which said that imprinting is on the first object that they see. So it doesn't matter which one of those that you use, but it is worth four marks. So each of those sentences would not be enough to get you the marks. You could do um, more than one piece of research. So you could do two marks on Schaefer and Emerson and then two marks on Harlow as an example. But you want to make sure that whatever you write is in enough detail. Now, I was asking you to outline the research so you don't need to evaluate it in any way. You just need to describe different research, but it might be worth referring to how it's different um, to the learning theory. So not just stating that this is what they found, but say that like, this is different to the learning theory because in order to make your answer stronger. So make sure you pink pen your answer um, and that you've annotated it. So we're going to be evaluating the learning theory um, and what I'd like you to do is have a go at writing your own evaluation paragraph. Um, so I've given you an example on the um, PowerPoint um, of how you should answer this question. You can use any of the evaluations that are in your booklet. There's four to choose from. Have a go at that and then have a go at filling out the explain or evidence for each of the um, evaluation points in your booklet. Make sure that, as it says, like your answer should flow. So write it in a logical way. Make sure that you don't just write this increases the validity full stop. If you're going to use key terms like validity or application to real world, you must explain what they mean and not just state them. And make sure, as always, it links back to attachment. Like, Does this support or go against it? And why is that a good or a bad thing? So make sure you're referring to attachment throughout your answer. Give it a go and then next lesson we're going to go over the answers. So that's all for now um, and I look forward to hearing from you after this PowerPoint. Thanks. Bye.